Hi guys. So today we are going to finish chapter 14, which is basically we're going to be talking about vision. So our visual perception is actually going to depend on a few different things. Not only the obvious eye, but all of the accessory structures, the optic tracks, the primary visual cortex, and all of its association areas in our brain. So we have photoreceptors in our eyes that are able to catch photons but they can only catch photons within the visible light spectrum. So you might remember Roy G. Biv. That is how you remember how the wavelengths go. So the wavelengths are usually anywhere from 400 to 700 nanometers. And again, this is a visual light spectrum. So we're going to start with the accessory structures of the eye. So first, the eyebrows. You might not think the eyebrows really serve a purpose, but they actually do. They have a protective function. They're going to help keep things from falling out of the air into your eyes and also keep sweat out of your eyes. Your eyelids or the palpebrae are also protective like the eyebrows. If somebody goes like that towards you, you're going to flinch and you're going to blink. So the eyelids actually protect our eyes to an extent. Obviously, if somebody pokes you in the eye, it still hurts or if something is going to go through the eye. So it's a minor protective function, but it's still a function nonetheless. Eyelids also spread lacrimal fluid, which are tears over the eyeballs. The tarsal plate is connective tissue that supports the upper and lower eyelids. The mimobian glands are sebaceous glands inside of each tarsal plate, and these function in lubrication. It's very important to keep our eyes moist. The upper eyelids are more movable than the lower eyelids because they have more muscles. And this picture shows you all of these accessory structures and parts of the eye that we're going to talk about in a minute. So just like the eyebrows and the eyelids, the eyelashes are protective in nature. So we have a few barriers protecting our eye from things just flying in there. At the base of each hair is what's called the gland of Z. And this is a sebaceous gland that unfortunately can get infected, which is called a sty, and that's very painful. Warm compresses will often help with that. There are six muscles that move the eye, the extrinsic eye muscles, and hopefully you remember those from last semester in the muscle section. The conjunctiva is a thin mucous membrane that actually lines the inner aspect of the eyelids and then continues on the front surface of the eyeball, except over the cornea. We have stratified columnar epithelium, which has a lot of goblet cells, which remember is in mucus production. And if you get vasodilation in this area, you'll have bloodshot eyes. Irritation or infection will also cause the bloodshot. Lacrimal fluid is tears. It is made up of water, mucus, lysozymes, and salt. There is about one milliliter produced per day, and it helps keep our eyeballs moistened. It also cleans and protects against infections. There are two lacrimal glands, which are almond-shaped. They're under the lateral portion of the upper eyelid. They secrete the lacrimal fluid, which again are tears. They do it by the lacrimal ducts. There are six to 12 for each eye, and it goes onto the upper conjunctiva. Then it drains into two lacrimal puncta, which we would call tear ducts. Each lacrimal puncta is gonna lead into a lacrimal canal. And then both lacrimal canals are going to drain into a nasolacrimal sac and then into the nasolacrimal duct. The nasolacrimal duct then drains into the nasal cavity. So that is why oftentimes if you cry, like a real hard cry, your nose starts to run. That's because it drains into your nasal cavity. Watery eyes can also occur if lacrimal fluid builds up. If you have a blocked nasolacrimal duct, you have an inflammation of the nasal mucosa, so a cold. Overproduction of tears is in response to parasympathetic stimulation. So it can be caused by an emotional response, like if you're crying, tears are gonna spill over the edge of the eyelids and then drain into the nasal cavity, which again will cause that nasal stuffiness, runny nose, and it just gets all terrible. Okay, the anatomy of the eye. You have three layers in the wall of the eyeball. The first is the fibrous tunic. This is the outer coat. Now it is avascular, so it does not have any blood vessel innervation. The cornea is in the front, which is non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium plus some collagen, which remember collagen you should associate with strength. Then the sclera is the white of the eye. This covers everything except the cornea. 
It is dense connective tissue and collagen, very protective, and it maintains the eyeball shape. At the junction of the sclera and the cornea is an opening called the sclerovenous sinus. The second layer is a vascular tunic. So this is the middle layer. It's also called the uvea. The choroid is a dark brown color due to melanocytes, and this lines the sclera at the back of the eye. It absorbs the light rays so that they don't scatter once they enter the eye. It also carries nutrients to the retina. It is a highly vascular area. The ciliary body lines the scleroporneal junction, and the ciliary processes are folds of epithelial tissue that contain a lot of capillaries and are very vascular. They secrete the aqueous humor, which is a watery fluid in the eye. The ciliary processes also hold the iris in place. Ciliary muscles focus the lens, and they are circular smooth muscle. Between the cornea and the lens is the colored part of the eye, which is called the iris. There are circular and radial smooth muscle fibers in the iris, and the dead center hole in the center of the iris is called a pupil. That's what allows light to enter our eye in the first place. So the iris is going to regulate the amount of light going into the eye by making the pupil smaller or larger. There's autonomic control over this. If you have parasympathetic stimulation happening, your pupil will constrict. If you have sympathetic stimulation happening, your pupil is going to dilate. So the radial muscles are going to contract. Now, if you have sympathetic stimulation happening, think about it. You're excited, you're in your fight or flight mode. So your pupil enlarges because you want all of the possible light to come in that you have. Whereas if you're just chilling and reading a book or watching a movie, you just ate a meal, your pupil is going to constrict and those circular muscles are going to contract because you don't need all of that excess light coming in because you're just relaxing. Nothing's happening. The third layer is the retina. This is the nervous tunic. It lines the posterior three-fourths of the eyeball, but the main function is image formation. There's pigment epithelium, which is the non-visual portion of the retina. It contains melanin similar to the choroid, and it actually helps the choroid absorb stray light inside of the eye, so that light's not scattering everywhere. The neural portion is the visual portion of the retina. This is the photoreceptor layer. The photoreceptors are the ones that can capture those light rays and convert them into graded potentials. There are two types of photoreceptors, rods and cones. Cones are specialized for color vision, visual acuity, and seeing in bright light. Rods are specialized for black and white vision, especially in dim light, and for seeing different shades of dark and light, for shapes and for movements. The macula lutea is the exact center of the back of the retina. This is a visual axis. The central fovea is the area of sharpest vision, so we have the most cones located here. Rods are mostly on the periphery of the retina, cones towards the center. So from the photoreceptors, the impulses are carried by bipolar neurons to ganglion neurons. The optic disc is our blind spot. So that's where the ganglion cells exit. So this is also called the optic nerve. So here's a picture showing you the optic disc how the blood vessels innervate the retina, and then the macula lutea and the fovea centralis. So we have about 120 million rod-shaped receptors in each eye. Each contain a stack of membrane-bound discs that have rhodopsin in it. Rhodopsin is a photosensitive pigment. The low light threshold of the rods lets us see black and white images. So we lose these as we get older, which makes it more difficult to drive at night. So if grandma says she has problems seeing at night, it's why? Because she's old. She's losing her rods. It's not her fault, so don't get mad at her. Here is a picture showing you how everything is laid out. So you have the pigmented layer there at the top. You have the rods and the cones, as you can see. They capture the light, and then they're going to send it to the horizontal cells and the bipolar cells, and then the ganglion cells to the optic nerve, which is then going to exit out the back of the eyeball. Cone-shaped photoreceptors are bright light and color images, and you can see those mixed in with the rods. They have opsins instead of rhodopsin. So the opsins are their photosynthetic pigments, 
and there are actually three varieties based on the type of pigment they contain. They are red, green, and blue. The eyeball also has cavities and chambers. So the lens is avascular, meaning again, no blood vessel innervation. It is located just behind the pupil and the iris. It focuses light rays for clear vision. So this is our visual acuity. It's held in place by suspensory ligaments, which in this picture you can see they're kind of on the side. And it divides the eyeball into two cavities, the anterior cavity, which is the front of the lens, and the posterior cavity, which is behind the lens. This is also the vitreous chamber. So the anterior cavity in front of the lens is the space between the lens and the cornea. It is filled with a very watery fluid called aqueous humor. Remember the ciliary processes behind the iris to create aqueous humor. So aqueous humor is produced at the ciliary body and secreted by the ciliary processes. It travels along the posterior surface of the iris and then flows through the pupil into the anterior chamber, which is the front of the iris. Then it drains into the scleral venous sinus, which is also called the canal of Schlem, and I love saying that, and then it's returned to the venous system. It delivers oxygen to support the avascular lens and cornea. It also helps maintain intraocular pressure. Intraocular pressure is important to maintain if you have an increase in ocular pre intraocular pressure, you will have glaucoma and that can damage the retina over time. My mother of course has glaucoma and she has to put eye drops in her eye every night in order to try to balance the pressure out. The aqueous humor is replaced every 90 minutes and it also helps inflate the walls of the eyeball to keep the eyeball pressed against the retina very firmly. The vitreous humor is a posterior cavity, so this is the space between the lens and the retina. This has a gel called vitreous body. Vitreous body also helps maintain that intraocular pressure, the shape, and keeps the retina smooth against the eyeball. Vitreous body is formed during embryonic life, and the problem is it is never replaced. So as we age, it starts to shrink. And this can actually lead to a medical emergency situation called retinal detachment. It needs immediate repair or you will go blind. Refraction or bending of the light rays has to occur in order for an image to be produced. So the cornea and the lens are gonna focus the image onto the retina. Keep in mind, it's upside down and reversed. The brain then rearranges this information so that we can perceive things right side up. If you have abnormal refraction, you can have myopia, which is nearsightedness. The object actually focuses in front of the retina. Hypermetropia is farsightedness, and the image focuses behind the retina. Astigmatism is when you have an irregularly shaped cornea or lens. Normal vision is emetropic. Accommodation is the focusing of the lens. Presbyopia changes with age. Basically what happens is your lens loses its elasticity. It doesn't have a lot of elasticity in the first place, but what it has, it loses. So it loses the ability to focus up on close things. And then we need to get bifocals. So I used to have to wear regular glasses. And as I get older, now I cannot see things like normal. So I have to have bifocals. Convergence is the inward movement of the eye so that both are directed at the object being viewed. And that's what happens if you put your finger towards your eyeballs. The nearer the object, the greater the degree of convergence that's needed to maintain our binocular vision. And convergence helps us maintain our binocular vision and see three-dimensional objects in the first place. Constriction of the pupil, we have autonomic reflexes that control the circular iris muscles. So this is going to allow light rays to enter only through the center of the lens so the image is very clear. So as you can see to the picture on the right, your pupil constricts as the circular muscles of the iris are contracting. This is parasympathetic innervation. So this is going to be used for bright light as well. Normal light, your pupil will be mid-size. And then in dim light, your pupil has to dilate and the radial muscles of the iris contract. This is also sympathetic innervation. 
So again, when you're fight or flight, you're excited, you need to get out of somewhere or run away from that serial killer, your pupils are going to dilate because the sympathetic nervous system is going to contract those radial muscles. So the visual pathway, when light rays strike the photopigments, a receptor potential is going to develop inside the rods and the cones. This is transduction. That's going to release neurotransmitters to the bipolar and horizontal cells. Then they're going to send the message to the ganglion cells through the retina to the optic nerve, which is cranial nerve 2, don't forget. Then the optic chiasma, which is the crossover, to the optic tract, to the thalamus, because remember that's the relay station, and then the cerebral cortex, specifically the occipital lobe. Some of the axons will cross to the opposite sides, others will remain uncrossed. So this creates the nasal and temporal visual fields. We have three types of neurons in the somatic sensory pathway. First order neurons are going to conduct impulses from the somatic receptors to the brain or spinal cord. The cranial nerves go into the brain stem, the spinal nerves into the spinal cord. Second order neurons conduct the impulses from the brain and spinal cord to the thalamus. This is where the neurons are going to decusate or cross over to the opposite side so that all somatic sensory information from one side of the body reaches the thalamus on the opposite side of the body. And then third order neurons are going to take the impulse from the thalamus to the primary somatosensory area of the cortex on the same side. So first order neurons are first in line. They take the impulse from the receptors to the brain or spinal cord. Second order neurons are second in line. They're going to take that message from the brain or spinal cord to the thalamus. The thalamus is the relay station, so that's going to decide where it has to go. So third order neurons are going to take it from the thalamus to that primary somatosensory area of the cortex. We also have ascending and descending tracks. Ascending sensory pathways of the spinal cord, you have the dorsal column system and the spinal thalamic tract. Those are the two major ones that connect the periphery with the brain. The dorsal column tracks are going to carry impulses for proprioception, discriminatory touch, pressure, and vibrations. Here we have two tracks, the cuneate fasciculus, which are nerve impulses from the upper limbs, upper trunk, neck, and posterior head, and the gracile fasciculus, which are nerve impulses from the lower trunk and lower limbs. The spinothalamic tracts, you have the lateral and anterior columns. They carry impulses to the cerebral cortex for things like temperature, tickle, itch, and pain. From the limbs, the trunk, the neck, and posterior head to the primary sensory motor cortex on the opposite side from the side of stimulation. So remember, left side controls right, right side controls left, because they cross over. The trigeminal thalamic is going to carry nerve impulses for vibration, tickle, itch, pain, touch, pressure, from the face, nasal cavity, oral cavity, and teeth, to the primary sensory motor cortex, again, on the opposite side. The spinocerebellar are going to carry nerve impulses for proprioception from the trunk and lower limbs, from one side of the body to the same side of the cerebellum. This is going to allow us to have balance and keep our posture and also be coordinated. The somatosensory neurons are not distributed evenly in the body. This is the somatosensory homunculus, and the relative size of these regions are going to be proportional to the number of specialized sensory receptors in that body part. So the more receptors that there are, the more area that's dedicated of the brain. So here you can see the genitals, for example, do not have a lot of area, but the nose, face, lips, eyes, tongue, all have a lot of area. So we have more sensory receptors in this area than in that area. The motor homunculus, motor activity is also dictated in the same way. So any motor neuron not directly responsible for stimulating muscles is called an upper motor neuron. The upper motor neurons are going to connect the brain to the appropriate level in the spinal cord. So the motor homunculus shows you how much area is dedicated to each particular thing. So as you can see, once again, the face, eyes, mouth have a lot of area. 
the hands have a lot of area versus let's say the hip. So those upper motor neurons are going to carry the impulse to the lower motor neurons. So all excitatory and inhibitory signals that control movement on second order motor neurons, they're known as lower motor neurons. So they descend to innervate the skeletal muscle. Lower motor neurons only provide output from the central nervous system to the skeletal muscle fibers. So they're also called the final common pathway. So you've got the first order neuron that's going to carry the impulse from the receptors to the brain and spinal cord. You've got the second order neuron that's going to carry it from the brain and spinal cord to the thalamus. You've got the third order neuron that's going to carry it from the thalamus to the somatosensory area. Then a decision is going to be made, and then the signal is going to go out to an upper motor neuron and then to a lower motor neuron, which will actually innervate the skeletal muscle. We have direct and indirect tracks. The direct tracks are pyramidal tracks. They carry nerve impulses for voluntary movements and precise movements from the cerebral cortex. So this is conscious movements. The axons of lower motor neurons are going to extend through the cranial nerves to the skeletal muscles of the face and the head, and then through the spinal nerves to innervate the skeletal muscles of the limbs and the trunk. Two of the major ones are the lateral cortical spinal tract and the anterior cortical spinal tract. The lateral cortical spinal tract is responsible for precise movements, skilled movements of the hands and feet, and your agility. The anterior cortical spinal tracts control movements of the trunk and then proximal parts of the limbs. The cortical bulbar pathway are impulses for the control of skeletal muscles in the head. These are associated with the cranial nerves. The indirect or extra pyramidal tracts are the lateral and anterior columns. They originate in the midbrain. This is unconsciously. Nerve impulses for involuntary movements, muscle tone, balance, equilibrium, and posture. There are five major ones. The rubral spinal is for voluntary movements of the distal parts of the upper limb. The tectospinal are reflexive movements of the head, the eyes, and the trunk in any response to visual and auditory stimuli. And remember the superior and inferior colliculi are responsible for those reflexes getting out there. And then the vestibulospinal is for maintaining posture and balance in response to our head moving, so that when we're moving our head, we don't fall over. And then the lateral and medial reticulospinal maintain posture and regulate muscle tone when we're moving, ongoing movement, so like when we're walking. There are also integrated functions of the cerebrum, like sleep and wakefulness. This is controlled by the reticular activating system. Remember, it's not necessarily one thing, it's a collection of things. So the reticular formation are patches of gray matter that are kind of scattered in the white matter of the brainstem, the spinal cord, and the diencephalon. A portion of the reticular formation is the reticular activating system. And this is what acts as the alerting system to wake up the cerebral cortex, help us pay attention, and make sure we stay awake. When the RAS is stimulated by nociceptors, touch, proprioceptors, bright light, or sound, it's going to send impulses through the thalamus where the message will get dispersed to the different areas of the cortex. Again, this is responsible for waking us up, maintaining consciousness, and getting aroused from a deep sleep. During sleep, the reticular activating system activity is very low. Sleep is actually a state of altered consciousness or partial unconsciousness from which you can still be aroused. Neurotransmitters that cause sleep, serotonin and norepinephrine. Melatonin, which we hear a lot about, especially in the supplemental area, is a derivative of serotonin. Each is produced by specific nuclei in the brainstem. As far as sleeping goes, we have two types, non-REM and REM. Non-rapid eye movement sleep, you have four stages of slow wave sleep, stage one, two, three, and four. REM sleep is where our most dreaming occurs, and we have a very high oxygen consumption by the brain during REM sleep. So when we first go to sleep, we're in non-REM sleep. About every 90 minutes, a REM period will occur. 
and then each episode of REM lasts longer and longer and longer and longer. Learning, which you guys are all doing. This is the ability to acquire new information through instruction or experience. Associative learning is when a connection is made between two stimuli. So we're going to talk about Pavlov's dog. Non-associative learning is when repeated exposure to a single stimulus causes a change in behavior. Habituation is when repeated exposure to some irrelevant stimulus causes a decreased behavior response. So when you're hitting your alarm to snooze and you don't even realize you're hitting your alarm to snooze because you're so used to it. Sensitization is repeated exposure to a noxious stimulus that's going to cause an increased behavioral response. So you get more sensitive to whatever this noxious stimulus is, and you're going to keep increasing your behavioral response in response to that noxious stimulus. Plasticity, our brain is very plastic. It's the capability for change associated with learning. So there are structural and functional changes that actually take place in our brain as we learn, and new neuron associations get made. So memory is the process through which information that we have acquired is stored and retrieved. Declarative memory or explicit memory is memory of experiences that can be verbalized. Procedural or implicit memory is memory of motor skills, procedures, and rules. Immediate memory is extremely short-lived. So as soon as we hear something, it's pretty much gone. Short-term memory lasts longer than immediate, but is still pretty short-lived. What we have to do is transmit the information we learn from short-term memory to long-term memory. That's what we want you guys to do for this class. Transfer that information over. You can do this by rehearsal or consolidation, using mnemonics, or anything that works for you. Rehearsal is probably, repetition is probably the easiest way to do this. The more you hear something, the easier it is to learn. So think about one of those songs you hear on the radio 50 million times. Before you know it, you're actually singing the song, whether you like it or not. Now, you didn't go and Google the words and look them up and memorize them to try to sing this song. You have just heard it so many times that you know the words. Do that with this class. Read things out loud. Go through it over and over and over again, and it's going to stick. So only about 1% of information is transferred, and even that can be forgotten. But if you learn concepts and ideas and you can still explain and understand everything, that's what really matters. You might not necessarily need every little detail about every single thing, but you'll know the concept. And if you can explain that, then you're good to go. Disorders. Flaccid paralysis happens if the lower motor neurons get damaged or diseased. It affects the same side of the body, and what will happen is the muscle will remain limp or flaccid, and you'll lose the muscle tone. Spastic paralysis is when the upper motor neurons in the cerebral cortex are damaged or diseased. This is going to affect the muscles on the opposite side of the body. Muscle tone is going to be increased, and reflexes are going to be exaggerated in this case. Amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, also known as ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease, is a progressive degenerative disease that attacks the motor areas of the cerebral cortex. Also, in the lateral white columns, the axons of the upper motor neurons and the cell bodies of the lower motor neurons. Basically, what happens is you get progressively weakened because your muscles will atrophy. And it often begins in sections of the spinal cord that serve the hands and the arms, and then really rapidly progresses to involve the whole body and face. It does not affect your intellect or sensations, but unfortunately, because of the degenerative of the muscles, you really can't act on anything or do anything. Parkinson's disease, when you have deterioration of the basal nuclei, and you will have kind of spastic movements, and I can't think of the word, um, twitches and things like that. 
Huntington's disease is an inherited disorder. Again, you'll have rapid jerky movements that are involuntary and they have no purpose. Tourette's syndrome is characterized by motor tics or vocal tics. So you will make involuntary body movements or use inappropriate or unnecessary words. A dysfunction of the cognitive neural circuits between the basal nuclei and the prefrontal cortex cause this. Schizophrenia, you have excess dopamine activity in the brain, and this causes delusions, distortions of reality, hallucinations, paranoia, and there is a genetic component to that. OCD or obsessive compulsive disorder, you experience repetitive thoughts, and those cause repetitive behaviors. So you have these obsessions, these repetitive thoughts that you cannot get rid of, so you feel like you're obligated to perform certain behaviors. For example, you might think that there's going to be a major accident if you don't close your door three times. Or you might think that something's gonna, something bad's going to happen to your mom if you don't flick your light switch three times, something like that. As far as sleep disorders, insomnia is when you have difficulty falling asleep or staying asleep. Stress, excessive caffeine intake, disruption of circadian rhythms, depression, a lot of things can cause this. Sleep apnea is when you repeatedly stop breathing for 10 or more seconds while sleeping. Most often this occurs because your pharyngeal muscles allow the airways to collapse while you sleep because you lost some of the muscle tone there. Narcolepsy is when REM sleep cannot be inhibited during waking periods. So you will involuntarily fall asleep at any time. And it usually lasts about 15 minutes and it occurs throughout the day. So people with narcolepsy obviously cannot drive. Amnesia is a lack or loss of memory. You have enterograde or retrograde based on whether you can't form new memories or you can't remember anything at all. And aphasia is injury to the language areas of the cerebral cortex. So this is Broca's area and Wernicke's area we were talking about before. So you either cannot use words or you can't comprehend words. You have receptive aphasia, expressive aphasia, word deafness, word blindness. And like I said, this happens if you get injuries to Broca's area and or Wernicke's area. So make sure that you are familiar with all of these disorders in the different sections of the chapter. Some of these we talked a little bit about, some of them not so much. You don't have to know every single detail about every single one of these, but just be familiar with them. And that is all for now. I will see you in the next chapter. Bye.